Luke records this. One of those days, Jesus went out into the hills to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him, chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. How many have a driver's license? Is there anything you had to do to get the driver's license? What did you have to do? Pass the test. I had to renew my driver's license last year. I failed it the first three times. <laughs> Don't tell me how I could do that. I did it. I just, it was unbelievable. And that, you know, you push the buttons and it comes up, you failed. I mean, what? <laughs> Took me four tries to pass that stinking thing. You have to pass the test. You have to qualify. Anybody have a job or a position in, in life where you're earning an income that you had to qualify for? Yeah, every one of us probably, right? You have to take tests, take classes. How many have ever applied for credit? <laughs> that was a good one. You got to qualify for that, right? Teachers have to qualify, right? Right, Davey? Doctors have to qualify. Lawyers have to qualify. Contractors have to qualify. Pharmacists have to qualify. I was a pharmacist in my old life. I graduated from USC in 1969, way before most of you were born. In order to practice pharmacy, I had to pass three days of board exams. We all have to qualify. Students, students have to meet certain standards to be advanced. Well, they used to have to pay standards to pass. So we all understand that there are standards, qualifications, requirements, we all have to demonstrate, we all have to qualify for lots of things in our life. True? Those are the tangible kinds. Of, what about the intangible things? Does, do things like character matter? What do you think? Yeah, sure. How about experience? How about self-motivation? How about social skills? Do those intangibles matter and qualify us for life? I think so. Are there qualifications and standards for people who lead God's people? Yeah, we want people to be qualified. We want people to be as Paul would say, of good repute. First Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1, the Apostle Paul lays out. He's writing to Timothy and Titus, pastors. He's telling them how to have church, how to appoint elders. He says these are the qualifications to be an overseer, an elder, a pastor, someone who leads God's people. That person must be above reproach. We want all of our leaders to be above reproach. We don't want... To, to, to be able to have anything laid at their doorstep, any suspicion that's unverifiable. They must be a one-woman kind of man for a man. Temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, 
not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Must manage his own family well, see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone doesn't know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Must might be a recent convert, he may become conceited, fall under the same judgment as the devil. Also, he must have a good reputation with outsiders. He will not fall into disgrace and enter the devil's trap. So we see there are qualifications even for those who would lead in the church. Now, should all Christians meet those same standards? Or is it just for leaders? No, all Christians should do it. God doesn't lower the standard for members of the church, his body. Jesus puts it this way in uh, Matthew chapter 5. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So we are always aspiring towards what? Yeah, holiness, perfection. We're aspiring to that. Which begs the question about priorities in life, doesn't it? What are my priorities? What are my priorities? We're going to be talking about that in a bit. So we're talking about qualifications. What qualifications must a person demonstrate or evidence for entry into the kingdom of God. How many works do I have to do to get into the kingdom of God, Erica? How many? How many heard my story of the, pine, or the, the coconuts? We were in India years ago. And I used to live in Hawaii, and so I love coconuts, fresh coconuts. So we're evangelizing. We're on the main street down in the city of Madras in India. And the Hindu priests are following us, surveying us. And I saw a guy with a huge, big cart of coconuts. I thought, oh, I'm going to go and see if I can get some coconuts from that guy. So I went over to him and I said, are you selling coconuts? He said, no. I said, why do you have all these coconuts? He said, well, they're, they're for my God. I said, you're collecting coconuts for your God. He can speak English. You're collecting coconuts for your God? Yes. So he'll forgive my sins. He knew he was a sinner. And I said to him, just exactly how many coconuts do you need? I said, what if you're just one coconut short? (laughs) Bummer. (laughs) So he said, oh my gosh. So I said, what if I told you there was a God who's already paid all the coconuts for you? (laughs) He said, there is such a God? Yes. Tell me his name, please. Jesus. He's the only God. You can get rid of all of your other gods. There's only one God. His name is Jesus. He's already paid all the coconuts. You just need to trust in him. Give your life to him. And you'll be saved. I had a chance to lead him to the Lord right there in the middle of the street. What's my point? The point is you cannot qualify. None of us can do anything. We are fallible, weak, limited human beings. Nobody, humanly speaking, can qualify for the kingdom of God. Did you get a coconut? <laughs> yes, I did get a coconut. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> In fact, he gave me two. There are no qualified people. No qualified people. And since that's the case, God in his grace chooses unworthy, unqualified people to people his kingdom. Why? Because that's all he has to work with. I love it when people say to me, Pastor, I'm struggling with low self-esteem. Good! <laughs> Look what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. 
God chooses the what things of the world? The foolish things. God chose the what? Weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world, the despised things, things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. What does that do for your sense of self-esteem? That's, that's the truth. That's who we are. We have nothing to offer to God except our foolishness, our sinfulness, our pride, our arrogance. We come with empty hands of faith. That's the truth. God help me. Forgive me. I'm a sinner. Will he forgive you? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So since there's no qualified people, God in his grace had to choose unworthy, unqualified people because that's all he has to work with. Wow. That should humble all of us, huh? Give us perspective. Now the 12, 12 apostles, like all believers, were unqualified sinners, also saved by God's grace. And they were sovereignly chosen by him for his purpose. You were sovereignly chosen by God for his purpose. Say that with me. I was sovereignly chosen by God for his purpose. Jesus told his disciples, and by extension to all of us, he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Now, he didn't just choose us to choose us, and that was it. That's the end of it. No, he chose us to what? What does Elsie say? To bear fruit, fruit that would what? Last. To bear fruit that would last. Are we bearing fruit? What kind of fruit? We'll talk about that. In spite of all their human limitations, God used these 12 men, these 12 apostles, to powerfully and positively impact the world like never, ever before. Sin and rebellion has caused the world to be upside down, and God used them to begin to turn it right side up. To restore. Let me suggest to you that the gospel, the good news, must, must of necessity cause a revolution in one's life. It must. If you believe the gospel, you're at this point, you're one person, and you hear the gospel, you believe, and it causes a revolution. You're not the same person anymore. How many can identify with that? Oh, just a handful of you. Okay. I'm working hard up here, guys. <laughs> Work with me. But not only a revolution in my own life, it must cause a revolution in the lives of those around me. There's a sovereign God. He's ordained that each of us be in various spheres of influence. Neighborhood, family, work, recreation, all these little areas, school. We all have been planted in spheres of influence. Who should we be influencing? Others. Yeah, others in those spheres of influence. Simple enough, huh? Question is, are we? Are we bearing fruit that lasts? He's chosen us. Not so that we would just sit back and be happy and say, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm forgiven, I'm in, I'm going to heaven. No, no, it's much more than that. Much more than that. There has to be a revolution in your life. And there has to be a revolution out of your life into the lives of those around you. Doesn't mean you have to be obnoxious. It's just that you demonstrate genuine love for people and genuine concern for people because that disarms them. Our goal is not to win an argument. Our, our goal is to share good news with people. The apostles were so impactful 
They were so impactful because they were surrendered completely to Jesus. So it comes down to surrender. We can talk a good story, can't we? We can say thus and such, and you know, and I'm praying for you. And, and, and. But we'll only go so far. You got to be surrendered. Surrendered completely to him, realizing that it's his power made perfect in my weakness. Far too many of us are timid and scared to just share with people. We don't be rejected. We end up thinking we have to do it in our own strength. No, no, no. Just step out in faith and just do it. Just do it. Confident that his power would be perfected in your weakness. God, I know you're with me. Okay, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to share. I'm going to reach out. I'm going to touch. I'm going to minister. I'm going to do something. And remember, it's the gospel. Not those who proclaim it. It's the gospel that is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Good news. We have good news. How many want to hear good news? Yeah, most of us all. We always want to hear good news, right? Right, Joe? Good news. Give me some good news, buddy. How many like a good sale? I mean, a really good sale. I mean, a bargain. Man, you're, you, you're, you're working hard. You're saving money. You want to, you're just trying to get this thing that you really want or need. Just out of reach. And your friend comes to you and says, yeah, you know that thing that you, I found it, I found it's on sale. It's 99% off. Now, let's just say, for the sake of argument, you're, you're, you're kind of having a down day. You're in the blues, you know. Do you need more bad news or you need some good news? Good news. So your friend comes to you and says, look, that thing that you were looking for, the thing that you want, I found it, it's on sale, 99% off. Would that make a difference in your life? Only if you believed them. If you didn't believe him, it would make no difference. But there's something in us that says, really? We have a hunger for hope. We have a hunger to live built into us. So if you believe that person, wow, changes you. Changes you. What's my point? Good news, even temporal good news, has power inherent in it to change you if you believe it. What about God's good news? What about God's good news? If you believe it, could it change you? Oh, yes. Spiritual leaders, not the same as natural leaders. Lots of natural leaders around, right? Let me contrast spiritual leadership with natural leadership. Natural leaders trust their judgment and make their own decisions. We're taught to do that. Trust your judgment. Trust your gut. Make your decisions. Spiritual leaders humbly seek God's will. Natural leaders are ambitious and driven. Spiritual leaders seek God's will and his glory. Am I going too fast? Yeah, no, yeah, no. I never please you guys. Natural leaders enjoy exercising authority over others.
spiritual leaders seek to serve others. Natural leaders are motivated by success. Spiritual leaders are motivated by love for God. Natural leaders are independent. Spiritual leaders are totally dependent on God. You ever heard this, or maybe you said it? That person's a natural born leader. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, we, we do that all the time. I believe, literally, that there are people who are naturally born leaders. Accent on the word natural. I also believe that there are people who are nat- naturally made leaders. In other words, circumstances in their life cause them to stand up. But it's different. It's different from being a spiritual leader. I believe that Peter probably was a born natural leader. But he is also the clearest example of how God builds a spiritual leader. You can be a natural leader, but it requires God to build you as a spiritual leader. Peter was chosen, and he was equipped by the Lord to be a spokesman for the twelve. How can I say that? Well, because Peter is the most prominent of the twelve. He's mentioned more often in the Gospels than any other of the twelve. None of the twelve are recorded as speaking as often as Peter spoke, nor did Jesus address any of the twelve as often as he did Peter. None of the twelve was so often rebuked by Jesus as Peter. And no disciple had the chutzpah to rebuke Jesus except Peter. No one confessed Jesus' true identity more boldly and explicitly than Peter did. And yet, paradoxically, no one denied Jesus more vehemently than did Peter. No one received higher praise from Jesus than Peter, but neither did Jesus address anyone else as Satan. And yet God took this common man. God took this common man with a vacillating, impulsive nature and gave him a new nature. A new nature. That would make Peter into the unquestioned leader of the twelve and the boldest and most powerful preacher in the early church. Witness Acts chapter 2, when Peter preaches his first sermon. He's never done this before. He stands up, he preaches his first sermon. What happens, Ed? 3,000 people are in the altar call. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, that's right. And the church is off with a bang. Peter. Now, Peter's birth name was Simon Bar-Jonah. Matthew chapter 16, we know that. Simon, son of Jonah or son of John. He was a fisherman along with his brother Andrew. They were partners in their fishing business. They made their home in a place called Capernaum. And Capernaum where Jesus made his home after he was unceremoniously excluded from Nazareth. Jesus named Simon Peter. He's sometimes identified as Simon, sometimes as Peter, and sometimes as Simon Peter. Peter was a sort of a nickname. It means rock. Petros, the Greek word for a piece of rock or a stone. Cephas is the Aramaic equivalent of Peter. 
You see them both referred to in the Gospels. In fact, in John chapter 1, Jesus says to him, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas. Aramaic was the spoken language in the first century, and Greek was the written language. So he's renamed. These were apparently, when Jesus says that, those are apparently the very, very first words that Jesus ever said to Peter. And from then on, Rock was his nickname. Cool, Rock. Rock. What should we call it? That's called Rock. Call you Rock. Now, sometimes Jesus would refer to him as Simon, which would be probably in the context of a correction or a rebuke. Jesus gave him the name Rock as a reminder to him about who he should be. Whatever Jesus called him sent a message. If he called him Simon, Jesus was signaling to him he was acting like his old self. If he called him Rock, He's commending him for his actions in terms of the way he should be. There's an old saying, treat me like you want me to be and that's what I'll become. Treat me like I am and that's what I'll remain. Whenever Peter acts like his old self, even the gospel writers call him Simon. Look with me at the passage in Luke chapter 5. So when they put out, and Jesus says, let's put out and let's catch some fish, right? Remember that? One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to who? Simon. And asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down, taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to now notice that this is Luke identifying him as Simon. Put out into deep water, let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, okay. I'm the fisherman. I know we didn't catch anything. But because you said to do it, I'll do it. That sound familiar? Okay, Lord. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. Now notice what Luke says here. Then what? Simon Peter saw this. So you begin to see a transition just in the name. No longer is it Simon. It's now Simon Peter. The context, he falls at Jesus' knees and says, Go away from me, Lord. I am a what? sinful man and so forth and so forth and so forth you get the point in Luke's gospel again chapter 22 Jesus tells him Simon Simon twice emphasis Satan has sought permission to sift you like what wheat did he get sifted big time Later in the Garden of Eden that same evening, when Peter should have been awake and praying, he fell asleep. Mark says this. Then he, meaning Jesus, returned to his disciples, found them, what? Sleeping. Does that sound familiar? What does he say? <laughs> Simon. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so you'll not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is. Man, when temptation comes, what should you do? Fall on your knees and be praying. God help me. God help me. God help me. If you see temptation out there and you're heading towards it, stop. Say, God help me. Help me. Help me. As we all know, the flesh is weak, right? Will he help? What do you think? Oh, yeah, of course. That's a prayer God will answer. Apparently, whenever Peter needed correction of some sort, Jesus would refer to him as Simon. It must have reached a point in his life that whenever Jesus said Simon, Peter would cringe. 
He might have thought, please call me rock. Jesus may have replied, I'll call you rock when you act like a rock. How many have had their parents say, call you by your full name? You know you're in trouble. John, in his gospel, refers to Peter 15 times, and he does so as Simon Peter. Interesting. Apparently, John couldn't make up his mind which name to use because knowing Peter as well as he did, they're lifelong friends, they're fishing buddies. He saw both sides of Peter constantly. So he's not going to call him Simon. He's not going to call him Peter. He's going to call him Simon Peter. The last time Jesus called Peter Simon, when do you think that was? The very last time he uses the name Simon. It's after the resurrection. It's on the beach. There's a restoration breakfast. How many remember that? John chapter 21. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter. Now remember, this is John's gospel. John always refers to him as Simon Peter. But Jesus refers to him as who? Simon, son of John. Do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you? Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, notice, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Third time, he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Why does Jesus query him three times about whether he loves him? And why does Jesus use his birth name, Simon, son of John? Why do you think? Yeah, because Peter had denied him three times. He's giving now Peter, Simon, the opportunity to reaffirm his commitment. To shift from Simon to Peter. And Jesus restores him at that breakfast. This is the last time Jesus ever had to call him Simon. A few weeks later, on Pentecost, the birthday of the church, the rest of the apostles, along with Peter, were filled with the Holy Spirit, and then it was Peter, the rock, who stood up and preached his very first sermon. 3,000 people are added to that number that very day. Powerful. Peter now. From then on, he's Peter, the rock. But Peter is exactly like most Christians, carnal and spiritual. We are born again. We're brand new spiritually. We have a brand new spiritual nature, but we still live in this old earth suit, don't we? We can be carnal in the times that we can be really spiritual. He succumbed to the habits of the flesh sometimes, so do we. And he functioned in the spirit at other times, so do we. He was sinful sometimes, but other times he acted the way he should act, as a man after God's heart. This vacillating man, sometimes Simon, sometimes Peter, Sometimes Simon Peter was the leader of the 12. This vacillating man was the leader of the 12. He was the leader of the 12. Wrap your mind around that. God uses less than adequate people. He uses them because that's all he has to work with. Weak people, fallible people. Do you suppose that Jesus knew Peter's weaknesses and faults? 
failures, shortcomings. But he also saw in him the potential under his own transforming power to accomplish amazing things. Same is true of us. Does God know our limitations, our weaknesses, our faults, our, limit, our, our shortcomings, our failures? Yes. Does he disqualify us? He didn't disqualify Peter. He worked in Peter's life and he grew him. He grew him into the spiritual leader God intended him to be. He does the same thing for you and I. You know what it is? It comes down to what? It comes down to surrender. It comes down to surrender. Are we learning the secret of surrender? Lord, not my will, but yours. Easy words to say, but you got to mean them. Over and over and over and over. Lord, not my will, your will be done. Your will is the best. Don't let me miss your will. How many are members of the church? You consider yourself a member of the church. Members are ministers. Say that with me. Members are ministers. Members are ministers. We get our identities most of all from, from our work and what we do, don't we? What do you do? Oh, I'm a doctor. Oh, really? I'm a dentist. I'm a lawyer. I'm a contractor. I'm a veterinarian. I'm an accountant. A lot of times that's where we get our identity from, when in fact we share our identity from what? The fact that we are what? Ministers. Oh, what do you do? Well, you know, I do doctoring, but that's on the side, just to put food on the table, but I'm really a minister of the gospel. Whoa, when was the last time you heard that? Should that be our testimony? Yeah. I'm a minister of the gospel. I'm a member of the church. God has saved me. He's given me giftings. He's given me talents and abilities he means for me to bear fruit that will last. Paul identifies spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4. He identifies spiritual gifts. These are things that Christians get free. Holy Spirit comes and lives in you. He brings his giftings according to God's will so that you can fulfill whatever he wants you to do and to be. Do you know what your gifts are? Do you know what your spiritual gifts are? If you're a Christian, you should be knowing what your spiritual gifts are and you should be learning to function in those gifts. Those gifts should translate into ministry. So let me pause a question to you. What's your ministry? <laughs> What's your ministry? Well, I go to church. No, no, no. What's your ministry? What's your ministry? I have a friend who's a lawyer. He ministers out of his law office. Helps people. Pro bono. I said, why do you do that? He says, it's a ministry. Other people have a heart for kids. They want to help kids. I knew a family that started a, a Bible study in their neighborhood for all the kids in the neighborhood. Go figure. Invited all the kids over. Made lunch for them. Drew the parents in. Pretty soon we had, guess what? We had a church. What's your ministry? You never know what God's going to do. You've got to step out in faith. How many would consider yourself a disciple? 
Oh, not everybody. Let me try that again. How many would consider yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ? Okay. Come on, Nellie, get that hand up. <laughs> Disciples. Disciple. Ministers, minister. Disciples. Disciple. So what's your ministry and who are you discipling? Well, I'm not sure what to do. Just bring them to church with you. That's a start. Take them to mini church with you. That's another start. Just say, come with, come with. Read the Bible with them. It's not rocket science. We should all be making disciples. Jesus made that grand suggestion, didn't he? The great suggestion? <laughs> Afraid of what was it? It wasn't a great suggestion? Nope. What was it? A yeah, great commission. Go. Literally, it's as you go, on your way, as you're going, make disciples. What's your ministry? Who are you discipling? What's your ministry? Who are you discipling? It's all a matter of priorities, isn't it? I read someplace, said this, something like this. Seek first, um, what is it? Oh, there, there it is. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and what? I'll take care of the other stuff. What's God saying? He says, I got this. You just do what I'm asking you to do. I got the rest of the stuff. I got it. Minister. Wherever God plants you, minister. Make disciples. He'll take care of everything else. But you got to trust him. And trust means you got to surrender. Can't pay him lip service. We used to have a slogan years ago. We printed t-shirts and hats and all this stuff. Some of you might remember it. Give them heaven. I used to tell, charge the congregation. As we leave, I'd say, give them heaven. Give them heaven. Give them heaven. Give them heaven. Amen? Next week, part two about Peter. Lord, thank you for Peter, but thank you for your marvelous grace. Thank you for coming into our lives and changing us as you did Peter. And thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being your, your servants in this broken, hurting society and world. Help us to be sensitive and help us, Lord, to be more and more surrendered to you and to your kingdom and to your will each day. Lord, trusting that you, you'll provide for us as we just serve you. We come to your table Lord, we just ask that your spirit would convict us of our failures, our wrongdoing. We can confess those things to you, confident that you forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we want to come to your table with clean hands. Holy Spirit, have your way in us.